Welcome to the psychology of entrepreneurship. I apologize to you all now um, who are actually listening to this that I was unable to actually give this lecture live on the 5th of December. I was sick at the time with some kind of flu like virus and I was unable to actually hold a conversation for less than five minutes without losing my voice. So we thought that this would be better for me to do this lecture at a later date instead of actually doing it on the 5th of December. Uh, due to the Christmas holidays though, we decided though that it actually was a better idea just to record this. And I'm going to walk you through a summary of what I was learning when I was diving into some of the writings and the publications around the psychology of entrepreneurship. So the history of entrepreneurship and the psychological research. The fascination with uh, the psychology of entrepreneurs is not brand new, of course. Uh, literature goes back all the way to the 18th century and it explores what's driving entrepreneurs um, and whether it's their traits that matters for the outcomes or actually the ventures themselves. Um, many studies actually consider that there is like a surge of, of research that took off in the mid 19 in the mid 20th century and that it, they were unifying approaches that were actually looking from economics, from psychology, from sociology, and business management. And they were all basically looking at the functions and the, and the, and the questions of what drives an entrepreneur, um, who is an entrepreneur, and what are the traits that possibly define them. One of the key launching points was marked, of course, by Frank Knight's book on risk, uncertainty, and profit in 1921, which um, was looking into careful research on the personalities of entrepreneurs. And then Schumpeter and later McClellan in 1934 and 67, they took a psychological perspective with individuals being the major focus of entrepreneurial research. And then from 1980s to 2005, most of the research was of concentrating on economics and strategic theories. Uh, but Gartner in 1988, he actually criticized the study of entrepreneurial personality traits, arguing instead for a focus on how organizations emerged. Gartner disapproved of the various definitions being used in, for entrepreneurship. And he was preferring to focus on a definition that emphasized the functional creation of new organizations. Since the start of the 21st century, there was a notable rise in public and intellectual fascinations with startup cultures. The entrepreneurial personality literature has enjoyed a resurgence and a convergence towards an increasingly consistent set of theoretical frameworks. There is meaningful insights towards innovation policy and business education. And there's a bulk of recent literature that seeks to answer two main questions. Do certain traits predict an individual's likelihood to become an entrepreneur? And do certain traits predict an entrepreneur's likelihood of achieving successful outcomes? So this is actually backed up by uh, this, this um, the research is basically is entrepreneurship is actually fundamentally personal. While personality theory remains right with its own set of contentions, researchers have primarily gravitated over the last few decades to the big five personality model. So let's give a little bit of a background to the big five personality model. This was made hugely popular by John Digman in the 90s. And it's used by many psychologists and uh, people doing actually even business research to um, look at the big five personality traits, which is also known in the acronym as OCEAN. Uh, you'll also hear it referred to as maybe a five factor model, but most of the people are going to be referring to it as OCEAN. So with the big five model, we're actually looking at um, 
basically five factors, which are openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So what are we actually looking at underneath each one of these? So openness, or openness to experience, describes um, the openness to experience, intellectual curiosity, creativity, or originality. It's measured on a spectrum. So meaning that um, from it's, it's measured from like high scores being that you're extremely curious and then low scores that you're extreme, extremely cautious. Being curious um, has shown in the literature that you're are also inventive and being cautious leads to being consistent. So um, being high or low on one or the other is actually neither good nor bad. So people who are open tend to shower their uh, to show their emotions, that they show appreciations for art, um, and they also um, show appreciation for unconventional ideas. This um, tends to lead to have strong personal preferences for a variety of activities over more disciplined routes. People who are less open to new ex to experiences are going to be more cautious. They're going to want to um, have more disciplined routine. They're going to want to have, um, you know, every single one of the every single day of the week planned. So, this is something that is um, this is one of the, the factors. The second one is conscientiousness. Conscientiousness describes impulse control and it's related to goal oriented behavior. But it also is measured on a continuum of um, how organized one is um, to how careless one is. So being organized turns results into um, being organized actually results in results. And so or it drives result oriented behavior or goal oriented behavior. Being careless gives people the benefit um, or the disadvantage, depending on the point of view of being easygoing. So highly conscientious people refer to making plans uh, or they prefer to make plans over spontaneous behavior. So um, it's, it's a personal preference about whether it's good or bad again. So those who like to have everything planned out will be um, a higher uh, in the levels of conscientiousness and those who like to go with the flow will be lower in conscientiousness. Um, and... This also has an impact, at least what some of the research say, on um, success in business or also in entrepreneurship. The third trait is extroversion. Extroversion describes tr the, the trend to seek company of others, activity, assertiveness, and sociability. The, in the model, the big five uh, personality traits model, extroversion is measured on a continuum from energetic to reserved or I love to be around a lot of people and I'd rather sit on the sofa and watch television with my dog. So being um, energetic allows people to be outgoing, being reserved leads to people being more of a solitary type. So um, if there's any questions about extroversion or introversion, you can ask Steve for my contacts and we can discuss it for hours. Um, Agreeableness describes the traits like altruism, trust, tender-mindedness, and modesty. So the continuum that uh, agreeableness is measured in the model is um, from compassionate to challenging. So it's looking at people who are as compassionate as being friendly, um, and they seem to cooperate with others, and detached people appear to challenge people, and in general, they seem to be more suspicious towards others. And in the extreme, agreeableness looks to be like, maybe you're a little bit too naive because you'll believe anything that anybody's going to sell to you. And then, um, uh, or even submissiveness. And then the opposite, so low agreeableness looks like you're competitive or maybe even difficult or completely um, um, untrustworthy. So, and the last, uh, personality trait that the big five model looks at is neuroticism. Neuroticism contrasts emotional stability and even temperedness with negative emotions. In the model, it's measured um, on a spectrum from nervous to confident. Nervousness turns 
nervousness in turns allows for sensitivity while confidence allows for one to be feeling secure. So sensitive people tend to experience anger, anxiety, depression, and um, psychological stress in general. Um, at its high, extreme neuroticism manifests itself as a reactive and excitable personality with high energy, but at the same time, it can be see, perceived as unstable. On the other end of the spectrum, high stability looks like a calm personality while at the same time being uninspiring and unconcerned. So what was the actual entrepreneurial research and some of the insights that I was finding in the literature? So um, a bulk of the existing research actually occurred between 1960 and 2000. And um, it's comparing the big five traits between the po populations of entrepreneurs and managers. So one of the, the key researchers that are actually looking at this was Zhao and Seibert, and they found that entrepreneurs to be more open to experience, more conscientious, similar for extroversion, less agreeable, and less neurotic, or in the big five lingo, O plus, C plus, E, unchanged, A minus, N minus. Then Invic and Lanford, however, found that entrepreneurs to be less to be significantly less conscientious and agreeable than managers and less extroverted, which actually led to an O plus, a C minus, an E minus, an A minus, an N minus, while they were confir confirming the other patterns. Um, as I dove a little bit deeper, the research showed that entrepreneurs consistently uh, were found to be higher in openness over managers. Zhao and Seibert, felt that conscientiousness, the achievement, motivation, and dependability was the most significant difference between entrepreneurs and managers. There's a lack of, of conscientious, um, let me see. There, was, there was actually a lack of consensus whether entrepreneurs scored higher on extroversion. Some researchers suggest that it might be more important for entrepreneurs, but Jean and Cyber concluded that the data did not show any reliable differences. If you look actually even into the, um, into the world and you look at people like um, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, who were also successful entrepreneurs and successful business people. These are both um, examples of introverts. So in some of the um, high tech areas and um, engineering areas or even science areas, you'll actually find a lot of introverts that are um, becoming entrepreneurs in this area. So the research is actually inconclusive really whether or not um, entrepreneurs score higher in extroversion or not. The literature um, suggests that entrepreneurs have modestly lower scores on agreeableness and neuroticism, but the gap is relatively small. But for the most part, in conclusion, the model is criticized for being too general and not easily predicting entrepreneurial specific behavior. And this made researchers look to, to creating new models. Another large critique of this big five uh, framework is that it's considered to be overly general in nature and that the, these macro personality traits um, cannot actually easily predict situation specific behavior of entrepreneurs. Also the understanding of a person's big five personality may not help in understanding specific mechanisms through which the personal, uh, personality impacts entrepreneurial attitudes and or actions. So the research started to go a little bit further and then they started to look at different personality traits that actually could impact um, or define someone's behavior and um, their attitudes and or actions. Some of these traits um, are the following. So self-efficacy and innovativeness. So 
Um, many researchers believe that entrepreneurs rely on a strong sense of personal self-efficacy to execute vision and a key eye for innovation for new markets and products. Self-efficacy is used to describe a person's belief that a task can be performed and is directly related to expectations, goals, and motivation. Self-efficacy is measured on two levels. It's either generalized or domain-specific entrepreneurial self-efficacy. So when you're looking into research and you possibly see the abbreviation ESE, it's actually referring to this uh, entrepreneurial self-efficacy. High self-efficacy correlates with work performance, small business growth, academic performance, and career choice. Innovativeness refers to how individuals respond to new things. Innovativeness can be global, a specific personality trait, or also behavioral. Adoptions for new products, for example, is behavioral. So um, how innovative you are on the spectrum of how fast you go out and buy the newest iPhone. Um, or it can be um, that you're innovative in creating new concepts or also new processes. There's different ways to measure innovativeness that have been around since the 1970s, but a uniform measure has not emerged in the research. The next personality trait that actually then um, shows up that they believe has an impact on uh, entrepreneurship is the locus of control. The concept first appeared in Rotter's theory of social learning in 1954. People with internal locus of control believe they control their own lives through ability, effort, and skill. People with external locus of control believe the controlling factors are a chance, fate, environmental factors that can't be influenced. Many emphasize that the locus of control, very often seen and abbreviated as LOC in their research, but they don't all agree on the application. Some believe that the internal locus of control is an essential measurable trait for entrepreneurial activities. Other believe that locus of control can be culturally influenced. Need for achievement. The need for achievement refers to an individual's desire for significant accomplishment, mastering of skill, attaining challenging goals. This was defined by Kerr in 2017. Researchers believe that entrepreneurship have a high need for achievement since building a business from scratch demonstrates individual abilities beyond conventional employment. Some research also indicated a link between the need for achievement and business performance. It's still a little bit inconclusive though because people can have a high need for achievement uh, and be in a conventional working environment and uh, also have a high need for achievement and be entrepreneurial and want to be starting up their own business. So, and then, let me just. In any event though, entrepreneurship doesn't occur inside of a vacuum and personality traits, human capital, and environment weave the context for um, each attempt to start and operate a new business. So there's, according to Barron, there's actually three process phases uh, where psychological concepts play a role in each of these phases. You have the pre-launch opportunity identification phase, the entrepreneur identifies viable and feasible business opportunities. You have the launch development execution phase where entrepreneurs assemble necessary resources for the starting venture. And then you have the post launch phase where the entrepreneur manages new ventures in such a way that it grows and survives. And I'm gonna go here now. So like, what is entrepreneurship concepts um, and how can they be improved using the psychological perspective? If you now look at this and if you dived into the paper that I sent you from Frieza and um, Gilsnick, there's actually a lot of insights there 
also regarding entrepreneurial alertness, which was defined by Kirzner in 1979 as the ability to notice business opportunities without searching for them. Um, entrepreneurs are people in the economy who are actually looking out and there are large discrepancies and things that are missing in the economy. Uh, before we had smartphones, for example, or before we had the iPad, you know, what are things that are missing in the economy or um, even going way back cars. I'm going from horse and buggy carriages to, to cars. So what is actually missing? We're having this constant desire to be uh, faster and closer to things. It's something that's missing. And so entrepreneurs come up to make, uh, to, to fill that gap. So the, the biggest thing is that scholars have actually been criticizing the fuzziness of what entrepreneurial alertness actually means. And in the paper from uh, Fries and Gilsnick, you have uh, that they, suggest that there's a psychological approach focusing more on behavioral and cognitive aspects that can help shed new light on what entrepreneurial alertness is. They referred to a paper from Kaish and Gilad in um, 1991 that actually conceptualized uh, entrepreneurial alertness as searching for information related to business opportunities. And these are at least one area that they can get a little bit more insights on. The study was actually criticized for being purely behavioral in its approach and limited generalizations of its findings, but it did provide new perspective uh, on entrepreneurial alertness, specifying the actions performed by entrepreneurs to be more entrepreneurially alert. There was also cognitive the cognitive aspects that were actually identified by Gaglio and Katz in 2001, uh, and they contributed they conceptualized that entrepreneurial alertness as a cognitive schematic, which was to prompt people to think about new and unusual ways about doing things. Thinking uh, in new and unusual ways should help people to identify in the way of business opportunities. So it, to actually a little bit more detailed into this psychological research behind uh, entrepreneurial alertness. There's still a lot of discrepancies and disagreements regarding whether a behavioral or a cognitive approach is better. Um, but in general, actually entrepreneurial alertness is actually there to identify the gaps in the market and to take, uh, and to take advantage of them. The other one, of course, is in business planning. Business planning is the documents outlining the current and the future trajectory of a future business. Uh, and this usually covers various areas such as products, services, customers. Um, it also covers like the whole entire thing of like business plans are central to entrepreneurship. They provide le legitimacy. Uh, they're commonly used by banks and people who are providing entry capital. Uh, and who are those who are making funding decisions to help with start, uh, starting capital. You have also in uh, entrepreneurial and startup business schools, courses focused on developing business plans, and they're thought to be one of the most important part of business school curriculum. Um, it is, however, sort of at least uh, a bit of a challenge because there is, of course, evidence that's supporting that creating business plans and drawing up business plans are actually beneficial, but there's also a whole school of research of the negative effects of business plans for startups and startup uh, ventures. Very likely, this is also for me what I consider a research opportunity, that it could be that there are advantages uh, to business plans for those who have high levels of need for planning and to be able to predict their next step. But then there's also probably those who like to um, navigate uh, in, in ambiguity will probably want to not have business plans. And so this is, this is a, a research opportunity to tie the need for business plans or the tool of business plans to the personality traits of whether or not people are um, high in conscientiousness or low in conscientiousness. So this goes back to the, the big five personality model where 
there are opportunities to actually link personality traits such as uh, the need for planning or the uh, no need for planning to whether or not it actually helps or deters an individual in that uh, area of actually starting up or entering the business field and starting their own business. Some will actually find it beneficial, others will find it tedious and time consuming. The other area that um, uh, Fries and Gilnick then referred to in their paper was also financial capital, which is of course the liquid funds to start a new business. That's actually also essential. You can't get anywhere without money. Um, but um, again, this goes back to the business planning that there's actually a psychological perspective on planning, efficacious, um, that's, there's pros and cons to it. So for, I do, I think there will, if there was somebody to do a research paper on it, that you probably find a strong correlation for those who have a personality trait or a need or desire to plan to be linked to those who actually do a lot of plans and find business planning and financial capital and liquid funds to start a new business very important and you will see a correlation to their success in business and for those from the personality side who actually have less of a need for um, business planning for uh, the actual financial capital liquid funds to start a new business they will actually have a lower correlation with these kind of factors so the personality traits of how conscientious one is in relationship to how successful they are um, could actually be a research opportunity that uh, where psychology and entrepreneurship could be researching together. And then of course you have the fourth dimension which is uh, entrepreneurial orientation which was defined by Lumpkin and Des uh, in 1996 as the autonomy, innovativeness, risk-taking, competitive aggressiveness, and proactivity. So um, the strategy literature construes entrepreneurial orientations as the firm's level, like so, like it, it, it describes it at a firm level. So it looks at it sort of like as a top manager, most commonly a CEO or uh, a general director or the um, some kind of manager at that top level, and firms with higher entrepreneurial orientation outperform other firms because autonomy, innovativeness risk-taking, proactiveness, and competitive aggressiveness, uh, competitive aggressiveness um, is considered to help firms to seek and exploit no, new opportunities. So this is, this is one of the areas to actually look at. Still, I find that entrepreneurial orientation is a bit of a curious concept. Uh, the concept is derived from Schumpeter's individualistic model of entrepreneurship. The measurement is based on managers' perceptions of their firm's strategic stances. It assumes that these firms' perceptions are uh, vertical and to some extent second, that these managerial perceptions matter for the firm. And third, that they are not just after the fact attributions to explain success or the lack of it. This, of course, makes sense to examine this concept with the psychological approach, which was done by Robinson in 1991. Uh, but actually they were still relatively inconclusive about whether or not there was, um, it was really important to the, um, if there's one. So going into it, let's go into the framework of entrepreneurship. So because all of these factors are actually then sort of here in this model. And so Frieza and Gelnick in 2014 proposed this, this model. So regardless of, of how you actually look at what personality traits that actually need to go into being successful as an entrepreneur, this model provides a new way of looking at it and still needs to be researched some more. But let me break down the model for you to begin with. So um, it offers several hypotheses to inform the area of, psych uh, of psychology and entrepreneurship. Uh, Action characteristics are in the center stage. You have personal initiative, goals, vision, search for opportunities, information search, 
planning, feedback recession, social networking, seeking of niche, seeking resources, deliberate practice, and entrepreneurial orientation. So there are no direct paths hypothesized to entrepreneurial success except from, from action and action characteristics. If the environment is not affecting action, the characteristics, or if it's not moderating the effect of the action characteristics, then we have, then Gilnick and Fraser were hypothesizing that there's not going to be any effect. Similarly, personality, motivation, education, and cognitive factors do not affect success directly, but only indirectly through entrepreneurial actions. Second, you have action characteristics are at the center stage at all phases of entrepreneurship. So when you go back to the phases of entrepreneurial um, success, you have the opportunity identification phase, you have the refinement uh, of business concept resource acquisition phase, and you have the survival and growth phase. So the first phase, taking action is important for identifying developing a business opportunity. Entrepreneurs who come up with business ideas have to gather feedback and seek additional information. Acquiring necessary resources and equipment, fulfilling legal requirements and developing marketing and sales strategies, um, an entrepreneur has to test whether the product service can attract buyers. So entrepreneurs who are more active in this phase are more likely to be successful in starting a new venture. This is actually also supported by research provided by Carter in 1996 and Liechtenstein in 2007. In the third phase, entrepreneurs have to take the necessary action to manage survival and growth of the new company. And the important actions are, for example, handling conflicts, negotiating contracts, forming alliances, developing new business strategies, and so forth. This was provided also in research from Barron in 2007. The construct summarized under our action characteristics is not actions per se, but rather ways of performing actions. So it may help to provide an example here. And any action accompanied or followed uh, by feedback. Some entrepreneurs develop a number of feedback systems. They ask more questions. They attempt to use what other unobtrusive feedback exists. Some entrepreneurs also actively encourage critiques and negative feedbacks in order to learn or to improve something or products or services. Um, all of this determines how effective the feedback actually is in that moment. Then um, from there, you have also this, the third assumption, which is that the more action characteristics lead to actions, that the more likely they are to be successful. So the characteristics that are typical of personal initiative, being self-starting, proactive, and being able to overcome barriers, these are likely to lead to higher levels of success than they are to be different action characteristics. The fourth and figure one and this figure here, this um, framework for entrepreneurship, um, it's organized in such a way with the exception of the environment, that the constructs on the left side are more distant and they're more distant from action. And the more distant they are from the action, the more distant they are at affecting success. So, um, or the constructs on the right side actually uh, are near to the action and therefore they are near to influence and success. For this reason, Fraser and Gilnick um, gave a few of the constructs double entries. For example, you have self-efficacy and entrepreneurial orientation uh, under both motivational effective ascendance and you also have it under action characteristics. Um, and I believe you also have it underneath Yes, yeah, so you, I see entrepreneurial orientation in, in both action characteristics and motivational effective ascendance um, and self-efficacy is, is also there. Um, the self-efficacy scales in entrepreneurial research usually describes several roles from starting an organization, thinking, creativity, 
uh, marketing, new roles, etc. If one places the frequently used entrepreneurial self-efficacy sales on a continuum from general to specific or from uh, distal to the proximity of action, uh, they usually fall between a highly general construct to a clearly specific one. So therefore, it's also um, closer to, to action characteristics. Uh, the similar reason applies to the area of entrepreneurial orientation. Uh, if this construct, construction is conceptualized as a strategic stance, then it belongs to action characteristics. If the construction is an orientation or an attitude, then it would indeed belong to motivational or effective uh, antecedents. Finally, the facets of entrepreneurial orientations, autonomy, innovativeness, um, aggressiveness, risk orientation, and proactiveness could be also in the personality dim dimension. Entrepreneurship research and psychological research in this area need to be very clear about which type of construct they're measuring and about developing appropriate measures for each type of these constructs. So, regardless of the discipline, though, regardless of the complexity or the integrated nature ship of this model or of entrepreneurship, um, researchers actually need to approach the setting carefully to reach reliable conclusions and to be careful to consider how much of the results of any one study can put across locations. So, from both the pieces of literature that I, I sent you, I think that there are still significant opportunities to be dove into and to um, discover in the area of psychological research uh, in relationship to entrepreneurship. The topic of, uh, of personality, psychological traits, and entrepreneurship uh, is of great importance for the study of entrepreneurship in multiple contexts, including the examination of occupational choice, the predictors of entrepreneurial success, the evaluation of the effects of entrepreneurship policies and the design and assessment of different approaches to entrepreneurship education. Many theories and empirical analyses have approached the concept. The literature still remains arguably underdeveloped and due to the conceptual and empirical challenges that are faced by the, re the researcher. Entrepreneurship is an exciting field of inquiry for industrial and organizational psych psychology. The findings related to personality characteristics and other attributes of entrepreneurs, as well as the correlation of those characteristics with business performance, also imply that there may be scope for including some personality development modules in entrepreneurship education. Many academic institutes have introduced entrepreneurship training, but these programs tend to focus more on hard skills rather than personality mapping and software preparation. While some personality traits are fixed, others are self, such as self-efficacy or achievement motivation can be influenced with relatively simple interventions. And this is where I think psychology and uh, the field of entrepreneurship can actually help one another. For those of you who are industrious and see an opportunity to uh, venture into the pioneering of uh, entrepreneur psychological research, then based on the literature and some of the stuff that I was reading, I wanted to share some of the potential pitfalls of entrepreneurial psychological research. When you're reading the research or even conducting your own research, it's important to pay attention to the subgroups of entrepreneurs being researched. Entrepreneur goes beyond Silicon Valley startups and can range from the creators of Main Street small businesses or even college students like yourself taking entrepreneurship classes. Recent research shows that even subgroups can have different behaviors and motivations. And even in the research that I provided you, you can have different motivations from country to country that are influenced not only from cultural influences, but also from um, startup and entrepreneurial legislation. So also look at what the economic environment is for the entrepreneurs in the study. Is it a high growth or a low growth environment? 
again, going back to like where it's at, what local or regional economic supports are in place. Are there subsidies? Is there venture capital? Is there tax incentives? What's going on in the local environment that's possibly influencing behavior? And um, did the external environment support or deter entrepreneurship? Again, high growth or low growth. From a psychological perspective, I like to look at it like a formula. So behavior is a function of personality and environment. So from a psychology perspective, they say that personality is for the most part fixed, but you have uh, environment that can be variable that actually then impacts your behavior. So I do believe and I do support the thesis that incorporating some kind of um, personality um, modules in the, these, these schools, as it was said here, uh, that actually, if you actually have some kind of personality mapping and um, uh, personality modules that are actually showing in this these entrepreneurship trainings what their personalities are, maybe then the entrepreneurs are then themselves better prepared for the environment and also uh, the task that they are being confronted with in the startup environment. So, um, if you have any questions for me, then um, please reach out to Steve and he'll give you my contact information. And um, I do appreciate you taking the time to listen to me. And I hope that you were able to get something out of the, the readings or even this um, short 40 minutes that you were able to spend with me online tonight. Uh, if you um, want to chat a little bit more about uh, entrepreneurial psychological research, or if you want to venture into doing your own psychological uh, research in relationship to entrepreneurs, um, reach out, we can talk. And I wish you all much success in whatever venture you're going to start off next. Thanks.